founder of Not So Mommy and creator of the Olive Green Childless Not By Choice Awareness Ribbon. In partnership with Tudum Global, we are owning our voice during National Infertility Awareness Week 2021. In this special Tudum Talk series, we will speak with experts who unpack topics that are important to people who are involuntarily childless. Today, we're talking with Ann Brock, blogger at Living in the Midst. I follow Anne on Instagram and love watching her page. She has a beautiful perspective on life and a wonderful way with words. I also really enjoy reading her blog. As I said, Anne, you have a great way with words. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Well, we are so glad that you accepted. Um, before we get started with today's topic, will you tell us just a little bit about your childless journey? Sure. So my husband and I got married in 2015. And soon after that, we were ready to start um, having children. And um, I was a little bit older, um, 35 or 36, and I wasn't getting pregnant um, as quickly as they thought I might. So I had some testing done and uh, they discovered that my AMH levels were very low. And um, even if we had decided to do IVF, um, I would have had to get a donor egg. Um, prior to receiving this news, we made the decision that we would be willing to do a few medicated cycles, but that was as far as we were willing to go. Uh, so essentially when the doctor shared that news with me, it was kind of the end of our journey um, trying to conceive. And um, adoption um, wasn't really a, an option for us as well for a variety of reasons. So um, then it was just the process of living in that grief and figuring out how to move forward in a life without children. As I've been following along on your Instagram page, I know that like me and Joby, um, you're a fellow endo warrior and have recently been diagnosed with endometriosis. And one of the things during National Infertility Week is what I want you to know. So it takes an average of 10 years to be properly diagnosed with endometriosis and 68% of women with endo were initially misdiagnosed with another illness. And so because of that, I'm really passionate about educating about this chronic illness. And I know since your diagnosis, you've been talking more openly about endometriosis and other women's health issues. So will you please tell us why you feel it's so important to be your own patient advocate, whether you're suffering with endo, infertility, or some other medical issue? Sure. So um, I've had very painful periods from the very beginning, from my first period when I was 12. Um, and before I went off to college, um, my doctor put me on the pill to help manage the pain, to help combat some of the, I mean, I would vomit every time. It was just really bad. Um, and there was never any talk of there actually being an underlying issue. It was just like, oh, you have a bad period. So fast forward. 20, 30 years. Um, and then I received this in, uh, infertility diagnosis and I was really struggling with having a painful period every month. Now I'm no longer throwing up, um, but still to the point where I was having severe pain down my legs and my lower back. And I would have to, you know, take time away from the things I wanted to do because my periods were so painful. On top of that, I'm not actually able to conceive. So it would just felt like a double whammy every month. And it was just emotionally um, painful and physically painful. So I talked to my doctor about it. I said, what about endometriosis? I had heard a little bit about it, but I wasn't quite sure if that fit. Not everything fit for me, but some of it did. And um, she dismissed me right away. She's like, no, that's not what it is. And she's like, you know, how... Um, how heavy are your periods? I was like, they're not heavy at all. In fact, they only last like maybe a day or two. She's like, well, that's great. And I'm sitting there almost in tears because I'm thinking there's nothing great about this. And for you to say that is very hurtful to me. And it just so happened she had to call me back about something else. And I called her out on it. And I said, that wasn't helpful. That actually really hurt my feelings. You're not really listening to my situation. And she apologized. She acknowledged um, what she said wasn't good. And so she suggested, well, how about we try a new medication for endometriosis? We'll try it for a month and see if it helps with your symptoms. If so, then that means you have endometriosis. 
So I did what she said. I tried it for a month and I didn't. It didn't really cause it, uh, um, solve the problems. I still had symptoms of IBS. I still had painful cramps throughout the month. There were still several things going on. And she was like, well, you don't have endometriosis. Okay. So um, then I started seeing a nutritionist to help me with this IBS stuff. IBS stuff. And it turns out I didn't have IBS. Um, there was something else going on. And um, and so she did some testing and she was like, yeah, it doesn't really look like you have endometriosis. So like one, once again, I was let down. I went back to my doctor and I said, look, I know you don't think I have it, but let me just outline to you all of the different things that I experience. And this is what I'm seeing on various sites about endometriosis. And I think she was just kind of fed up with me, a little bit annoyed. And she just kind of passed me on to a surgeon in her office. And when I met with <clears throat> that surgeon last August, and it was virtually, um, it was the first time that someone actually heard what I had to say, told me that what I was experiencing is not okay, that she's like, even if your period impacts you one day a month, that's more than it should. Like your period should not be this painful. And I just felt such a sense of relief that someone actually listened to me um, and believed me. And so then she said, okay, really the only thing we can do is, well, she, she started with an ultrasound just to, and there, they didn't see anything there. So she's like, the next step is really a laparoscopy. And um, I went back and forth because part of me is like, this is really expensive. What if they don't find anything? I just had huge, even though she was validating my experience because of 20 plus years of people not believing me or not really wanting to help me, um, I just, I wasn't sure that I wanted to have the surgery because I was really scared they wouldn't find anything. Um, but I finally decided to do it. And it turns out they did find endometriosis. And then um, not, on top of that, discovered that I also have, I think it's adenomyosis. I'm not exactly sure of the pronunciation on all these words, but, um, and that my uterus was just in, in poor shape for, and it, and by the more I talked about it, I was really, upset because one of the ways to solve the problems or maybe even just like touch on them a little bit were things that you do for IVF. And that was one of the reasons I didn't want to do IVF is because I didn't want um, to have all those um, different medications in my body and giving myself shots. I didn't want to do that. And yet that was one thing that she was offering and that just felt pretty cruel. Um, but then another option was a hysterectomy. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my, my journey of trying to have children ended a few years ago. Um, I still have a lot, hopefully a long life left and I want it to be a life full of energy and joy, a life without pain as much as I can control that. Um, and so I've decided to have a hysterectomy and my surgeon was 100% behind me and she agreed that that was probably the best choice I could make. Um, and, you know, if I hadn't been pushing my doctor from the very beginning, if I hadn't kept coming back to her, even though she would dismiss me, um, I don't think I'd be where I am today. And right now, for the first time in my life, at least for the last four years, I feel hope about my future because I feel like I... I have answers and that's been a huge thing for me. It's I've always wondered like, why, why are my periods so painful? Why do I have all these issues? And now I know, like I have names for it and just having a name for something, even if I decided not to have a hysterectomy, that just gave me like more sense of power back to me. Um, and I really, I feel hopeful about the, the hopefully pain-free life that's ahead of me. Um, and it's all because I kept pushing and I kept saying, no, there, there is something wrong here and I'm going to need you to work a little harder to help me figure out what it is. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as you, as you talked, I was, I, I felt anger for you that your doctor dismissed you like that. Um, and I know the only way to really 100% accurately diagnose endometriosis is through surgery. So it frustrates me as I'm sure it frustrates you when doctors say you don't have it because they can't possibly know that for sure. Um, and then I didn't realize that you had adenomyosis as well. So 
endometriosis and, and adenomyosis, I know both of them are difficult because um, they're misunderstood and then the symptoms do manifest in different ways. So if you don't mind, would you tell us a little bit more about your symptoms? Because I think others, sometimes they hear things and they're, they don't realize, oh, that could be related to endometriosis or, oh, that isn't really normal um, for a regular period. So um, the biggest things that I've experienced are um, cramps to the point where I can take three or four a leave and I still feel the cramps. Like, and it's hard to know. I mean, that's the, all of this is so challenging because I'm, I can only speak from what my body feels. And so I don't know what other people, how you would experience it in your own body. But I just know that, um, I have to take a lot of pain medication to even just kind of touch it. Like I'll still feel the cramps. Um, I get cramps or pain or like shooting like down my thighs and in my lower back. Um, here, one thing that I did not realize, um, pain during sex, um, for a variety of reasons, I was like, oh, I guess this is just how it is. I don't know. And the more I've read about it, it's like, Oh, and I learned that the way my uterus lays and because of the adenomyosis, it it kind of has made my uterus like not firm anymore. And so then it's like heavy and it's laying back. It's I forget like uh, what that's called. But anyway, it's laying back. So then I think that could be potentially impacting what they were labeling as IBS. Um, I have a lot of I've had a lot of digestive issues and most of those actually started just a couple years after my period started. So those things were like, I did not realize my whole life, these two things were on a line together. I just thought they were two separate things. And the doctors did, like no one ever said, oh, I wonder if your painful periods are somehow related to your digestive things that are going on. Um, so those are kind of the, the main things. There are probably others that I'm not thinking of right now. It's whenever I see those graphs on Instagram, well, they'll say like, here are all these different things that could be potential symptoms. And I'm like, how did, I don't understand how doctors um, don't kind of put these things together. Now I know when I started my period, that was in the early 90s. So I don't know how much endometriosis was even thought of back then as um, as a possible issue. Um, but those are the things right now that are jumping to me. There are probably others. And, and that's the other part of this too, is I have to like keep notes to remind myself. Even there are times when I think like, oh, if I would have tried harder or if I would have done this, but then I go back to my notes to remind myself, no, Anne, like there was nothing else you could have done. You would have needed to go and get someone else's eggs in order to conceive. Like that is not, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, we we blame ourselves or we think that there's something we could have done differently. And so one thing that I've actually done, and I, I should have had it out before I uh, started talking with you, but I wrote down in my journal reasons why I'm having a hysterectomy in case I forget. Because I think it's like, there are times when we just don't remember all the details and there are so many things going on in our bodies. And um, it's just helpful for me to have that written down. So I can go back to that on days when I think, oh, and hopefully I won't think this. Hopefully after my hysterectomy, I'll you know feel really great about it. But it's, I just, as for my future self, a gift to her, here's a reminder of why you did this and why you're, it's such a huge form of self-care. I know that's kind of like a buzzword, but caring for my body in the most important way that I can right now is having this surgery. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And I really like your idea about the journal um, because yes, in the future, it, for some reason, we do all kind of question, did we make the right decision? And uh, absolutely we did because we made the best decision with the knowledge that we had at the time. Yeah. Um, I did want to say one thing. Um, endometriosis was actually discovered in 1860. So the fact that still doctors do not um, understand and, you know, I just I appreciate you letting us know, you know, be your own patient advocate and you know your body and continue to ask questions even when they are dismissive. Um, so thank you again for for sharing all of this with us. You're welcome. Um, would you please let everyone know how they can connect with you? Sure. So I blog fairly regularly at um, annbrock.com. And then I'm on Instagram at living in the midst. Um, so 
you can find me in either of those places. Well, again, thank you so much for chatting with us today and thank you all for watching.